our next speaker our next speaker is uh, professor rohit bhatia he is from aims new delhi and he is president indian stroke association he Anand, has got to introduce let's go ahead we have we, have, we don't have time yeah, go, go ahead sir. go ahead sir, yeah that's what do you sir yeah thank you okay you need to stop sharing your screen i have to sir okay so thank you dr lal dr padma um, um anu vishnu for this opportunity uh, i i'm going to talk in next few slides a very basic uh, you know uh, basic learning we get from the non ms form of diseases and i think it's it's a very simple talk it's just a reiteration for the residents that we 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 usually see the these usual cases so let's go ahead so we've learned in the sea of autoimmune neurology in the last decade that it is probably a um, uh, i think an era of antibody and finding new and new antibodies whether they are central intraneuronal antibodies or they are the receptor antibodies which include mog and aquaporin 4 as well or they are synaptic antibodies which we have learned through many many facets of the autoimmune and cephalitis disorders so in the whole sea of disorders we get one larger chunk of disorders which we label clinically and we try to diagnose as demyelinating diseases now demyelination is a broad term but which envisages a lot of different disorders and when a patient is seen as the first event he could go in any direction and we we need to put all our efforts and all our thoughts together to really see which direction the patient is moving and what the diagnosis is if we find a specific antibody in a specific syndrome we are very excited and happy that we made a diagnosis if we make a diagnosis of ms which is not difficult in current era that's also happy news but there are patients with monophasic demyelinating syndromes where we are very uncertain with which remain yet uncertain because they are zero negative and many further unexplained disorders where we look for a lot of stuff but we don't find anything actually and we label them as demyelinating disease non specified but we follow them up to see how they actually move ahead in this in the spectrum of the disorders so this is a, a question for the uh, students if they want to answer that i have made a diagram of a of a channel and these are these red dots if they can identify the culprit antibody uh, that will be good so i think uh, is there a way to uh, look into the responses or i go ahead quickly anu Yeah. Okay, fine. So, if you look at this culprit antibody, this is classic uh, aquaporin four antibody because it is right at the synapt foot processes of the astrocytes. And and uh, if you look at the how it works, is that this is the vascular endothelium, this is the astrocyte foot process, this is the neuron and the myelin sheath. So, when there is an that there, there is an an antibody mediated damage along with the complement. it actually ruins the astrocyte foot process and that's why actually nmo spectrum disease is an astrocytopathy it's not really a demyelinating disease but the secondary damage which happens to the myelin sheath is because of the inherent complement and eosinophil mediated damage and that's why many many different uh, newer drugs are acting against the complement pathway for treatment of nmo spectrum disease so let's go to a case study and this is a 19 years old female with recurrent vomiting and hiccups in 2012 was diagnosed later had dysphagia or dysphonia this were her images if you look at the images the brain stem broke pretty much not normal and there is hardly something to really see but there is some hyper intensity in the diencephalic region at that moment she just received some steroids and she got better then in a year later she has ataxia and swaying and and she was treated with oral steroids and then someone put her on interferon injections thinking that it is multiple sclerosis and if you now see her disease is preferentially again within the brain stem the 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 midbrain and the pons area which is hyper intense and later she uh, uh, came to us with a with a with a with a syndrome of hiccups and vomiting for 2 weeks and this is what we found i mean she had a clean cord she had a clean brain but she had this classic area postrema syndrome and since we have lack of time and we can't take more questions so this lady was investigated 
Although I'd put forward this question that would you think it's a Bechet's disease, angiitis, clippers, or NMO spectrum disease? So this lady was found to be NMO IgG positive. But what I want to reiterate is that she never had a LETM, she never had an optic neuritis, but she had recurrent brainstem features, which which evolved uh, into a typical syndrome of area postrema. So we've gone a big way in uh, NMO spectrum disease, and if Dr. Lal would remember. Uh, Dr. Lal, remember yeah. that we were told that, you know, the diabetic disease is a monophasic illness. If you yes. see someone with paraplegia and severe vision loss, think it's a diabetic yeah. disease and, and it is going to be a single time disease and it's ruining the patient and this never relapses. We got a big way on there and, we, and as soon as people started to realize that it is a, it is the, you know, it is a relapsing disease and with the advent of the aquaporin 4 antibody, we, we have transitioned to a much, much wider understanding and with the advent of the new criteria, the, our understanding has further broadened. So the core clinical features for the residents to always remember is a long segment myelitis, a long segment optic neuritis, a area postrema syndrome, a brainstem syndrome, a diencephalic syndrome, and a cerebral syndrome. If you see such kind of a pattern in different forms and in and in in either in unison to start with or in, in a common presentation, you should strongly start thinking of an NMO spectrum disease, which itself has a lot of connotations now. And as we go into the evaluation paradigms, you learn that it is just not about optic neuritis, cerebral and transverse myelitis. It's a lot to do in aquaporin four patients with extra CNS complications as well, including SLE, associated Jogren's, associated myasthenia, even reports of myositis. So this is like a big basket of disorders now, and it is encompassing almost everything. When we say NMO spectrum disease, we mean NMO NMO like syndrome, even in MOG antibody disease. So this is kind of turning bigger and bigger as our understanding about it actually improving. And even among our series of patients, which is this paper currently in press, you will see that most of the patients will present with long segment myelitis and a long segment myelitis and optic neuritis together may not be the usual first presentation. They will generally present with an optic neuritis and later with an LETM. And a combination is not that common in practice. If I, I, I can put forward this to Dr. Lal and Asta and others that we never generally are seeing a typical presentation of an optico-spinal syndrome. They come in relapses, they come in different forms, and then we try, try to you know, make a diagnosis, especially if you have a classic LETM, then we are almost always wanting to be certain that it is going to be NMO. This is going to be NMO. But we always like to exclude associations to that, including Jogren's, vasculitis, and so on and so forth. But that's the usual presentation of these patients. So the term was unified, and this was unified because we said NMO, we said NMO and NMO, but then people found that there are zero negative patients as well. So we need to unify this by a zero status. NMO spectrum disease is a big term, but it allows future revisions. And that's what brought the revised criteria in 2015. So if you have these core clinical presentations, that is optic neuritis, myelitis, postrema syndrome, brainstem syndrome, diencephalic and cerebral, you need one, and a positive aquaporin-4 to make a diagnosis. If you have a patient who is zero negative, you need at least one of these three, which means area postrema, LETM, and optic neuritis, and then one other core presentation, plus requirement for an MRI to show you findings in the areas of periependymal involvement, especially area postrema or periependymal brainstem. So if you see such kind of patients, you may, after you excluded other causes, say that there is a possibility that you may be dealing with a seronegative relapsing disease. So that is something we must understand. Whenever you're reading an MRI of a patient of NMO spectrum disease, focus at the periependymal regions where the aquaporin 4 is strongly, strongly present. And, if, and this is all marked in red, and this has been taken from a very great review in radar graphics. If you look at the perinepidymal involvements, this is what the typical MRI lesions will look at. I'm not saying that if you look at extreme right around the fourth ventricle, you'll, you'll stop thinking of lymphoma. You will stop thinking of others. That's not my perspective. But what I'm trying to say that usually NMO spectrum disease MRI brain imaging is not that ghastly. It is very, very, either very normal or maybe very subtle. 
But if you get, then you must look for these areas of involvement because they are more specific to NMO than to MS in, 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 in a usual differential diagnosis. Let's go to a second case. This is a young girl. She's about 10 years old who has this long story of headache, drowsiness, optic neuritis, then ataxia, and so on and so forth. She initially gets a diagnosis of a meningitis. Then someone thinks about an immune-mediated disease. And then she's found to have this gray and white matter involvement along with optic neuritis, is treated with steroids, then is put on rituximab and IVIG pulses later. Of course, this diagnosis was revised to a diagnosis of a mock spectrum disease in a child presenting with, you know, brainstem presenting with, with diencephalic presenting with meningitis like illness. So MOG syndrome is a very close associate of neuromyelitis optica syndrome. Unfortunately or fortunately, MOG was a forgotten entity for, we all knew that there is something called myelin oligocyte glycoprotein. But over the last about five or six years, it's, or maybe about seven years, it's really come back in a big way as a potential, potential marker for diagnosing some specific forms of of, of, of opticospinal syndromes. And now this has been put together as a term called MOG associated optic neuritis, encephalitis and myelitis called the MONEM because a lot of pediatric populations, population patients, especially the ones who present with ADAM, may be actually MOG, which we never knew before because we were not looking for that antibody and that was not freely available for testing. So remember that if you see a pediatric patient with a recurrent ADAM-like episodes, strongly think of monem-like syndrome because these patients generally turn out to be MOG positive. So MOG antibody again encompasses a large basket of disorders. We have ADAM, we have optic neuritis, encephalitis, myelitis, and aquaporin-4 associated NMOSD as well. The pattern I'm saying, I'm saying the pattern. Typically they both don't coexist in positivity. That's in my experience. You will find it very rarely, but in my experience, they both don't coexist. So the presentations of these patients could be, you know, ranging from encephalitis to CRION to NMOSD to ADAM and relapsing remitting disease. And that's not very uncommon for MOG as we have known for over the years, over the years, slowly and steadily. So based on this, there were these criteria which were being Pub, which, which came into the publication about two years ago, which was recommendations to really diagnose MOG. And when would you really diagnose MOG? So if you look at the uh, a diagnosis of MOG, I've highlighted the important perspectives. If you have a monophasic or relapsing optic neuritis, a brainstem encephalitis or a combination, if you have an LETM, especially if you have an early conus medullaris lesion, think of MOG more than NMOSD. If you have normal supranatorial MRI with patient, especially with recurrent optic neuritis, isolated, that's more common for MOG than with NMOSD syndrome. If you have a prominent papilledema or a papillitis-like presentation, may be more common in MOG than an NMOSD patient. And one more thing I feel is that if you have a bilateral or a simultaneous optic neuritis, I think between NMO and MOG syndrome as a presentation, it may be more common for MOG than for NMOSD and especially pediatric patients with recurrent ADM. So if you find all of this, and I think it's not difficult anymore, Dr. Lal would agree to me that nowadays we screen most of these patients with this typical, usual, you know, syndromic presentations with our general antibody testing. So it doesn't really become a rocket science to diagnose because you're already keeping a possibility that you may be dealing with one of them. So that's made our life much easier than what it used to be two decades or all the time when I was doing my DM, when we really didn't know about these antibodies, they had not been discovered even that time. So one important perspective which may excite Professor Lal is about the CRION entity. This is a paper by Gordon Plant, which Dr. Lal knows pretty well. And they actually published this paper in 2014. And why I'm saying that, because we were diagnosing a lot of CRION when we had NMO antibody negative and just isolated optic neuritis, prime, prime and absolutely clean and pristine MRI spines and brains and no other finding on CSF or detailed antibody profile. So they went on to, and this is from their paper. I mean, they, they looked at the transition when NMO and GFAP also came as a biomarker and they found that many of these patients actually are NMO spectrum antibody negative. So they said that this is probably a separate entity and should not be put in the nosology of NMOSD and should be kept separate. 
And they came, came up with this criteria that you have ON and at least one relapse, objective evidence of visual dysfunction, NMO negative and contrast enhancement of the optic nerve and immunosuppressive treatments, uh, you know, uh, response. So they said, well, if you have this and you have nothing else, this is CRION. But unfortunately or fortunately, we moved further to this. And what happens is that CRION, a lot of patients who are checked now, they are actually more positive. Now, you may say that it may be an epiphenomena. Who really know what, knows what MOG is? Maybe MOG is just getting uplifted because uh, the myelin is getting damaged. But yes, we know that there is something which is now a biomarker. And in CRION, this is a paper which clearly states that people with recurrent CRION, they had strongly positive MOG, whereas people with monophasic had limited and recurrent non-CRION-like pattern had no MOG positivity. So... When we looked at our data, which we published early this year about MOG antibody mediated disease, and if you look at this, our syndrome at presentation was predominantly optic neuritis and bilateral optic neuritis in a, in a large proportion of patients and a recurrent optic neuritis as well. So I personally feel that the CRION entity has now slowly got blurred and we are entering into, the, into a pathway of more of a MOG antibody associated disease. We can always debate whether MOG exists, doesn't exist, but we know this is a potential biomarker. So I guess if you're seeing patients with relapsing optic neuritis, you can and you may like to even look for a MOG antibody disease. I'm not saying whether treatments may be different, but yes, if you know there is a biomarker, then you may have a different perspective about the patient's future presentations as well. So there is a blurring of of these disorders into one another. And I think we are transitioning more to our learning. If there was a time when people would say that MOG disease doesn't relapse, you know, it's a mono, it's generally a monophasic disease. But if you look at the longevity of how you follow up these patients, the longer you follow up these patients, you'll find that actually most of them relapse. So MOG is also a relapsing disease and we must not forget and that should be kept in mind because we need to make a decision for their therapeutic goals in the future. So for residents here, I've shown this slide many times before in my talks. If you have a patient of NMO spectrum disease, you have a MOG and an MS. That's what typical three differential diagnoses tend to happen. Look for the pattern in NMOSD. It will more posterior and chiasmal. In MOG, it is more anterior, but it is long segment, but chiasma is generally spared, and you definitely have an associated perineuritis as well in MOG. So look at your imaging carefully. There is always a spread to the perineural sheath as well. And in MS, of course, it is a medium and it may be sketchy. In the spinal cord, you have a LETM, which is generally cervicodorsal for an NMO, maybe conus and lower for MOG, although cervical and dorsal is as well well known, may not be very specific, and of course, sketchy for. MS with skip lesions and look at the pattern of the brain involvement. I mean, this is the typical diencephalic down involvement in NMO. In MOG, it is again brainstem, but a lot of gray matter may be involved, which typically may not happen in your MS patients. You know, MS is very discreet, pericolosal, juxtacolosal, brainstem, and so on. So it's not difficult. But if you see and keep this in mind when you're actually looking at your MR scans, they may, may help you in, in reaching some possible diagnosis. So let's go look into this case. This is an imaging of a patient with a relapsing disease. Look at this very, very carefully because this is a specific pattern. And I put this question as to what do you think the possible diagnosis could be for this kind of an image? Could it be a lymphoma? Could it be a MOG disease, Bechet's, or a Clipper syndrome? Of course, because we're not taking the voting, I move forward. This typical pattern, which stands right in the brainstem, repeated attacks with this nodular enhancing lesions is called what is being labeled as chronic lymphocytic inflammation with pontine perivascular enhancement response to steroids called the Clipper syndrome. Now, Clipper syndrome came from this very, um, you can say the first cardinal paper from, in 2010 from the Pitox group from Mayo, Sean Pitox group from Mayo, where they actually found that there were patients who had repeated attacks involving the brainstem. And when they biopsied them, they actually found only extensive inflammation in the perivascular zone, which was not like a vasculitis. So in one of our recent cases, which Dr. Anu has been seeing and, and, and is, is an interesting case, I do not know whether we can fit her into a clippers, but this is a girl who presented with subacute progressive pan syndrome in December. 
came to neurosurgery in February, and I'll show you the scans, and they thought it may be a tumor. And she underwent a biopsy. Uh, and then after that, she, because of the lockdown, she never came for a review, but kept on taking steroids as a exercise from the local practitioner and came to us. Now, this is the initial MRI, which, which she had in October of 2019, with small specky lesions. And then she actually increased by the time she came to neuro, neurosurgery with this large uh, nodular enhancement around the fourth ventricle from where she was biopsied. And this is the last two scans are the scans which are actually after she kept on taking periodic steroids. And when she came to us now, she had almost clear brainstem. And in the biopsy, it actually showed highlighted CD3 and CD20 cells, a lot of cytotoxic cells. And they also labeled it mainly an inflammatory disease called either cerebritis or a clippers like presentation. So going back to this, we don't know whether or this patient is clippers or some other monophasic recurrent demyelination, but I think this could be potentially a clippers variant. Now, if you look at the original paper from Sean Pitock's group, you'll realize that the age group is like wide from 16 to almost 80 years of age, which means that this particular disease can actually extend across age groups. This is a small series, but this does suggest that this may not be necessarily in disease of the younger people. And if you look at their location of perivascular enhancement on the MRI, I've specially highlighted this because this was not restricted to pawns. Even if they labeled it as clippers, they had patients with midbrain, pawns, cervical cord involvement. So clippers, although is predominantly pontine, but it can sway itself up and down a bit. And we must remember that, but it restricts predominantly itself to the brainstem. Yes, I showed you the first case, which was NMO, which restricted to brainstem. I showed you another case, which did not restrict to brainstem either. But this particular case of the last one I showed, which had cerebellar presentation, this does make us concerned that this kind of a pattern with nodular enhancement, responsive to steroid and exclusion of most of your diagnosis, including lymphoma, of course, should be excluded, but the pattern of enhancement is different, could raise a perspective of clippers. And this is the image from their paper, which shows you this classic pepper-like nodular enhancement, typically more pronounced in the brainstem, upper medulla, and the lower midbrain. This is very classic of this kind of a presentation of clippers. And this is another zoomed image of that. Look at this pattern of enhancement. So, the diagnostic criteria by the same group came in 2017. They said, if you have a subacute pontocerebellar dysfunction, responsive to steroid, and no better explanation, and, and think about clippers, if you have this typical classic pattern of enhancement, think about clippers, it could happen even in the spinal cord, not just restricted to the pons, but the enhancement is typical pepper-like nodular enhancement, linear in the spinal cord. And of course, the pathology will show you all this predominant infiltration of cells. In fact, our patient actually had CD8 more than CD4, so we're not certain whether this is really clippers or not. Now I come to uh, one of the another variants, and and uh, 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 just to show you in the next five or seven minutes, if I mean this, I posed a question that if you see a patient with this white matter lesions, this typical radial linear enhancing lesions especially following a viral illness like influenza with encephalopathy and with presentations like, like altered behavior, sensorium. I pose this a question, what would you think? Look at this pattern of enhancement. This is like radial out from the ventricle wall. Radial out from the ventricle wall. And the, the options, of course, I, I wanted to ask about a differential diagnosis, but this classic presentation about a, a group of patients who were published back in the literature and really has, we have not really grown too much in our evidence for this disease because this can be a phenomena present even in NMO spectrum disease. But if you see this kind of a pre pattern, this is suggestive of what we call the GFAP antibody disease or glial fibrillary acidic protein antibody disease. And this typically presents as a steroid responsive meningoencephalitis with meningitis or myelitis. Now, this generally has previous reports were after an influenza viral in disease, but has been also seen in patients with varicella and, and interestingly in NMDA receptor disease as well. So I really don't know whether this is a damage related epiphenomena again occurring, but the way the pattern of imaging goes, which is very, very typical, and these patients classically have a meningoencephalitic presentation, it does bound us to think that this may be a separate entity. And 
and interestingly more that this also can be i mean this associated with an ovarian malignancy typically look for that if you see a young female presenting like this and antibody associated in nmda receptor as well now gfap is not routinely available this is done with specific assays but we we don't screen for this usually for such patients and and the enhancement pattern is very classic remember if you see such linear radially enhancing lesions think about this is the original paper from the from the group in annals of neurology when they first published 102 patients and if you look at this paper most of the people who presented with encephalitis or meningoencephalitis had this typical pattern of radial enhancement and as they as you became more heterogeneous in presentation most of this pattern of mri findings actually just disappeared and there was a coexistent nmda receptor antibody present in patients with encephalitis so i do not know whether this is a coexistent disease really or whether there is actually uh, uh, the the gfap is some kind of an associated response to an nmda receptor antibody it is it is difficult when you see such kind of combination of antibody positivity in patients but yes this probably exists as a you know a separate entity uh, probably does exist as separate entity so when we talk about demyelination i'll just take my last 2 minutes it is not about just saying it is demyelination or demyelination is not difficult to think if i see an optic neuritis or a myelitis or i see a patient with optico spinal syndrome and i see a young person with relapsing remitting disease we bound to make a differential diagnosis of demyelination but we must think that within that in within those group of patients lie patients who could still be having a vasculitis a sarcoidosis a jogrens lymphoma autoimmune encephalitis beshes granulomatosis lymphoid cns infections and even paraneoplastic so we need to fine tune this and we have learned over the last decade how to fine tune this by imaging by antibodies by testing by appropriate examination and keeping our eyes alert to the neuroimaging features of these patients which i think are a very very important component when we are actually further segregating the patients downwards from the management perspective i don't have to put much doubt, uh, much hard work into this we all are aware that we have to treat these patients acutely with a, a with a pyramid of 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 treatment including methylprednisolone plex and ivig all i would like to say that don't differentiate your relapses that this is an nmo patient i need to be more aggressive this is a patient of crio and i want to be less aggressive this is a patient of mog i will be decide whether please have the same level of of thought process in escalating acute treatments because these patients may be left with sequelae so if you're not responding if someone is not responding to mps transition quickly to plex and i don't mind if the plex has not shown response in the next few days time think about an ibig rescue as well because patients may res respond so we don't know now as far as this is my last slide as far as the treatment for prophylaxis goes you need to take individual decisions if you see a patient of non ms demyelination and you are aquaporin 4 body uh, antibody positive we know the relapses are very high you treat with steroids plex and then straight away transition to long term immunosuppression choice is yours in which setting you are what the patient wants what is his desire he wants compliance he wants less frequency therapy but we are transitioning to more and more new drugs like aclozumab sertrazumab and sertlazumab for patients of nmo for mog antibody disease some people said it is a lesser relapse risk may not require a long term immunosuppression i totally disagree to that i think even mog antibody disease should be immunosuppressed because these relapse over the long term and for patients with no antibody and you have a first episode i would individualize decision and would like to treat if it is syndromic and initial event is very severe i would discuss with the patient and check their preferences do they want to wait and take a chance with another episode which has an un, because we don't have everything we don't have an antibody but if there is a very severe initial event which has taken a long time to recover i guess we need to seriously start contemplating about those so dr lal this is my last slide that we probably are 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 standing at the tip of the iceberg we we really learned a lot with non ms immuno you know these not non ms demyelinating diseases but i think there's a lot 
to do this. We're just at the tip of the iceberg. And I think we, we are learning and we'll continue to learn and expand our understanding about these disorders. And that's what is making this field extremely interesting. Thank you, sir, and all to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. Thank you so much. Remember, you, we used to hear so much about DevX and that DevX is an, is an Indian variant and it's an Eastern yeah, variant. Yeah, yeah. More common in India and Japan and uh, things like that. And now we have a logical basis for DevX actually. And I rem you remember when we would present cases, you would say the power of this patient after myelitis is 0 by 5. So there are less chances of his going on to get MS. So if he has mild weakness, he's got a higher chance of getting MS. Now we know why, because mild uh, spinal cord involvement is typically seen in primary demyelination as NMO mock disorders generally have severe you know, demyelination. And the same, oh. holds, the same holds true for visual loss also. So basically now we are actually only expanding on what we knew in the past by giving an immunological and pathological basis and giving it a substrate. There is nothing different clinically from what we saw when we were, you know, learning. We're still learning, but when we were residents, except that now we have a plethora of antibodies which actually have made a colossal difference in our understanding and in our approach to these cases. Thank you so much, Rohit. You are always a pleasure to have on board. No reversible pro proptosis this time. I'm so happy. You're better at both. I must, I must also tell you that this whole concept, you know, there used to be such a huge concept when you see this long segment myelitis, when when the Mayo people had never described the aquaporin for, it used to be labored a lot of time tuberculosis. Sir. Don't forget. And I think no, that was no, pretty no, much... No, no. You may have done such things. I don't... No, I have not done. No, 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 right. no, no, no. No, it was not labeled tuberculosis. Remember, no, no, I'm saying there is still a concern about tubercular myelitis a lot, which is goes much unproven. But I think we learned a lot that immunology is... Rohit, 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 please. I think I'm happy that the residents are there on board. Padma, this is all friendly, uh, friendly fire. It goes on. Wherever we do meet, there will be friendly fire. Rohit, if you are having a patient of tubercular myelitis in the absence of vertebral tuberculosis... Please get an NMO. Please get a MOG before you say it's tubercular myelitis. I don't, call, I don't diagnose tubercular myelitis at all. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. That, that's important. That's important. There is nothing called tubercular myelitis in the absence of vertebral tuberculosis until unless you've not done the NMO and MOG. Over to you, Padma, because there's no end to our...